picture the scene. You really want a powerful estate car with an ugly front end. It's 2023, you could get yourself a BMW M3 Touring. Fantastic. But imagine if it's 1972. What would you do then? And you want this car to be really powerful to the point of entering the Guinness World Record books. You build yourself the beast, of course. A car entirely built around a Rolls-Royce 27,000cc V12 Merlin engine that should be up there in a Spitfire in the sky. And that's exactly what this is, a car which went on to become the most infamous car in Britain. In this episode, I'm going to be fortunate enough to drive this out on the road. So welcome to a special episode of The Late Break Show. I'm Johnny Smith. <laughs> So what actually, or who actually, is the beast? Well, really, we need to talk about the man behind the beast. And the man behind the beast was a chap whose initials are on the front of the car, Mr. John Dodd. And John Dodd took this car as a rolling chassis back in the early 70s and bought it off a chap that had built the chassis to put the engine in called Paul Jameson. He'd originally met Paul because Paul couldn't get a, a gearbox to work with this colossal 27 litre V12 Merlin Spitfire engine. But John was a gearbox genius and John said, I reckon I know how I, how I could do that. And he devised this step up system with an automatic transmission from a, an American car in order to be able to transfer the incredible torque from the engine to the axle. He bought the car off Paul and then had a body made. A completely one-off body to go with a completely one-off chassis, but of course it had to package that humongous engine, hence why the bonnet is 10 feet long. John Dobb was a larger-than-life man who sadly passed away uh, last year at nearly 90 years old. This car has been in the family ever since. It's been John's brainchild, it's been John's obsession uh, his extension of his personality and that's why I wanted to feature this on the show. I am going to be able to drive this car later in the video and I'm one of very few people that's been allowed to drive it and John Dobb wasn't afraid of driving this to the point where this car used to in a previous life have a Rolls-Royce front grille on it. Rolls-Royce in the early 80s weren't pleased about this and took him to court and John being John was like okay the court case um, ensued and he drove to court in this car in London and may have intentionally broken it down on Fleet Street in front of all the newspapers to get a bit of PR. So the first day of court, he turns up in a 27 litre, 1,000 horsepower car. The next day, he turns up on a horse, one horsepower. <laughs> he lost the court case. He was made to remove the grill he decided to leave the country and the car then and he went to live in Spain for many, many, many years, until his death in fact. So what on earth is this? Well this body shell was made by a company called um, Fiberglass Repairs uh, and Fiberglass Repairs in, in Kent specially made dragsters, dragster bodies and that's why it has this weird kind of like funny car stance but this is actually not the first body shell this car has had because when in the mid 70s John took it to a car show in Sweden he drove it to Sweden of course from England um, to show it off um, the king of Sweden asked him to come and say hi because he couldn't get to the car show so we met the king of Sweden of course and on the way back from that the car actually caught fire and the body got damaged and this first body shell looked like a sort of mashup between a, a Ford Capri and a console and all sorts. But he got the insurance money and decided to not only rebody the car in this mad shooting brake style, but what he also did was he decided to take the engine which was a Meteor engine, so a, a Rolls Royce Meteor V12 for a tank, World War tank, to the Merlin engine. The same derivative of engine but one that was due to live destined to 
fly in the sky, either in a Spitfire or in a Lancaster bomber. And that is the engine that this has in it. Apparently it's a Mark 35 real deal Merlin without the supercharger on it because there's simply no place to put the bloody supercharger. That's why you have all these air holes and everything because it's a heavy breathing engine that needs lots of air because it's used to flying, not driving. So let's talk about design. Obviously, it's an incredibly weirdly proportioned car. The side, the profile of it's the, the weirdest, in fact. Centerline wheels, the front end, the suspension and the steering is from a, an Austin A110 Westminster. I think it's independent. The back end used to be Jaguar independent rear from an XJ12 um, for many, many, many years. And in fact, this axle on it, which is a Curry Ford 9 inch modified drag axle, was fitted just after he died. He'd had it commissioned and was going to fit it, but never got around to it. And bear in mind, this is a chap who, like I say, nearly 90 years old, and he still drove the car, still drove the car fast, and still wanted to try and set some, some land speed records and take it up the strip in Santa Pod. So that has the axle on it now. Side exit exhaust, apparently these doors are modified from a, a Mark III Ford Cortina, and we don't actually know because John Dodd didn't really write down a lot of spec about the car. It was all up here. And that's what we're now finding with John's family who have kindly let me come and see the car today and drive it. We're trying to decipher what bits are from where, and the start procedure alone is, a, is, a, is an epic story in itself. Bridge it on. Uh-huh. Then. Let me focus fan. in Check on the, the button. Oh, not fan. Fan. Which, what you put on there? A fan, just to make sure it's running. Okay. Because you can't hit with the engine running. So there's one pump there. Mm-hmm. One pump there. Mm-hmm. Check the pressure. Mm -hmm. Which is down there. Which you, I don't it's pressure. making a noise now. What's that noise? The pumps. Oh, the pumps. Okay. Okay. Right. Then, switch them off temporarily. Mm-hmm. Put the prime on which is the, the last one. Oh, that lights up? Yeah, that lights up. The others should light up, but they, they're old and they don't, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you, you you give it about a five to six second prime, switch it off, it changes the note. Mm -hmm. Put both magnetos on. One, two, right, press the button, it goes. So we don't know what windscreen it is. Come around here, you've got this mad, huge, almost hearse-like shooting brake. It's kind of like a Reliant Scimitar that's properly gone roidy and gone down the gym. <laughs> but I really like it, and I especially like the back end. It's got a multitude of Mark 1 Ford Capri rear lights and this hatch. So it's actually really practical, right? Like I said in the intro, if you want a practical but ridiculously powerful estate car, hello. If we're able to show them, there's some great archive photos of this car. This was in the Guinness Book of Records for several years for being the world's most powerful car and probably the biggest engined car, what with it being 27 litres. Just think about that for a second. 27 litres with 12 pistons. It's absolutely colossal. Um, and John used to drive it on two-star petrol because it didn't need really, really high-end petrol because it was a, a wartime engine that was used to running on any fuel you could pretty much get. Eight headlights, or is it four? I don't know, what I do know is that like a lot of this, there's bits from Rolls Royces, there's bits from other British cars. John Dobb was a massive patriotic British guy. He loved the fact that there was nothing more British than driving around in a car with an engine from a Battle of Britain plane in it. And that's what makes it so ridiculous and amazing. And it's still classed as a Rolls Royce. These headlights are actually from their Lucas units, I think. Yeah, they're the same as an Allegro or a Hillman Hunter or a Mark I Capri. So it's actually got Mark I Capri headlights and taillights, I think. Rolls-Royce bumpers. Obviously, the Rolls grille is no more. Let's not mention that again. And this Do you know what it reminds me of? I tell you what, this, the proportions and everything, it reminds me of something out of, out of a Hanna-Barbera cartoon that's been painted the colour of a prosthetic limb in the 70s. But what's cool, I know we joke, this is on the cover of numerous magazines. If we're allowed to use any archive shots, I'll show you some from where John did many, many uh, TV appearances throughout the, Europe with the car. 
uh, it was on the cover of Street Machine magazine in 81 with the Rolls grille on it, um, which is a really iconic thing. So this car is absolutely infamous. And the reason why I'm allowed to do this video is because this car, if you're watching this when I release this video on the Late Break Show, it's for sale right now for the first time in history. It's for sale, it's leaving the family, and you can buy it via auction uh, through Car and Classic. And yes, I do want it. Yes. If you thought the outside was 70s, the beast's innards are like Battlestar Galactica meets two miles per gallon, because that's what you're faced with. You've got these amazing laid back 70s seats, brown and beige two-tone, and all the glass fiber, the one-off glass fiber that was done on the outside, all this stuff is, is here. And there's such a colossal center console, because the last bank of cylinders under the engine bay sort of protrude in, uh, across into here. So this has all been molded around that massive engine mated to the TH400 auto box. Um, so it is a two-seater, even it, but it's got a massive amount of space at the back there. John never got around to fitting power steering, so it's it's just about arm power on this lovely 70s wood rim. I think it might be a Grant steering wheel, which I love. I'm noticing again that stalk is very strangely familiar to a lot of British car people. That's from a Hillman Avenger, I know it is, or something like that. Aero gauges, that's from a Ford. I'm sure that's from a Ford. But you know, it's a comfortable car, right? And there's loads of space in it because John actually used it as a Grand Tourer. When he moved to Malaga in Spain, he used to drive the car back to the UK for MOTs. He used to drive it regularly at near VMAX or as close to VMAX as he could get on the German autobahns. He said he never went beyond 185 because it started to feel a bit dicey. And I'm like, yeah, of course, because remember back then tire technology was nothing like what it is now, nothing like it. So the fact that this even would do over 150 and not feel weird is, is a miracle. The engine weighs just over a ton on its own. Just to put that in perspective, I'll show a shot of it now uh, parked next to a Suzuki Jimny. The whole Suzuki Jimny is the same weight as the engine in this. Let's reveal the beast, the heart of the beast. Gosh, that's so nice and so nice and warm. So this is, this is what it's all about. Now I am not an aeronautical expert, so please forgive me. What I do know, um, speaking to the Dodd family and, and reading up about it is, this is a Mark 35 Merlin engine, not a Meteor engine. So as I said before, in its original guise, it's had a Meteor engine, both Rolls Royces, both V12s, both 27 litres, but the, the, the Merlin was living in the sky with a Spitfire or a Lancaster. The Meteor was a ground dwelling machine for a tank. And when the car got damaged and got rebodied and rebuilt, that's when John decided to splash out actual serious cash back in the late 70s on putting a true Merlin engine in it, albeit without the supercharger. So it lives on a bespoke chassis. The V5 document refers to this car as a Rolls Royce coupe. But what John did is manage to package everything that you need here. You've got the steering box down there. You've got that suspension from a, an Austin Westminster. Crucially also keeping the damn thing cold because this is supposed to have lived up there in the air where it didn't need any cooling or man-made cooling. It just used the air. This has a huge, thick radiator there and a massive expansion tank, which I first thought was a a brown Pennington Bear suitcase, but it's actually an expansion tank. And it uses a Holly four barrel carb, which is underneath this piece of copper here, open throat carb with a homemade inlet manifold. And there, look, the engine disappears slightly underneath the windscreen line. How much power has it got? Well, if this was supercharged, like the original Merlin, it would have been about 1,500 horsepower. John Dodd always said in interviews it's around about 1,000 horsepower. So what was the purpose behind it? To get a car that could really go fast? Oh yes, cruise at 200 miles an hour and uh, beat anything else and make it all British. Apparently it was geared for about 300 miles an hour, but the gearing has since been changed because nobody needs to go 300 in this. Nobody needs to do 200 in the beast. <laughs> It's noisy, but it's fun. But that's the thing about John Dodd is he really liked to use it. He loved the theatre, the ridiculousness, the boundary pushing of this car. To the point where when he was in Germany once, he did actually um, 
overtake a, a baron, a, a German baron driving a Porsche, and um, ended up phoning Rolls Royce to ask them about this new high-powered coupe that he'd seen on the on the road. There are so many stories attached to the beast, and I honestly can't I can't explain all of them as well as the family would be able to. But um, what you do need to know is. This thing has twin magnetos because obviously it's an aero engine. Um, 760 pounds feet at pretty much idle. This is a low revving engine, about two and a half thousand RPM maximum. It idles at 150 RPM. Bear in mind an average family car probably idles at about 700 RPM, something like that. And that's the thing, it's not built to go in a car. And that was always John's genius of getting his step up system to work with an auto gearbox with such a low revving engine so that it could actually talk to the gearbox and the gearbox knew what to do, where to put the power and for it to be drivable in some way. Fuel tank, 26 gallon fuel tank this has in it. It used to be a dry sump when it was an aeroplane engine. It's now a wet sump for packaging purposes. Um, 10 gallons of oil. So when you come to do an oil change on the beast, you you're going to be spending some coin on just the product, just the oil, 10 gallons. But on the flip side, it doesn't need super unleaded fuel. Like I said before, it was it, it all run. John used to run it in the 70s on two star. If you're a young viewer, you'll have no idea what two star, three star, four star or five star petrol is. But it's basically grades of, of fuel, five star being the equivalent of super unleaded. Yeah, what a thing, though. I have to say, this is the first time I've ever seen the beast. I remember watching it on Top Gear. Uh, 25 years ago and Car and Classic just did a video with Steve Berry, the original presenter, um, who revisited the car after 25 years and it was brilliant. So I remember seeing it in mags, I remember seeing it I think on Top Trump's cards because of course no car can out trump it in terms of cubic capacity, 27 litres and in fact John Dodd used to MOT it even when he didn't need to anymore because it's it's tax exempt, MOT exempt, and it's ULES compliant. So if the new owner who ends up buying this wants to drive it around London, it is ULES compliant. I'll put a screen grab up to prove that. He used to just want to get the tax disc, which would say Rolls-Royce and 27,000 CC. I'm fortunate enough to have driven a lot of cars in my career, and I have actually been out before in a, a Rolls um, meteor engined car, a car um, called a Rover SD1 that I did for fifth gear on TV years ago. But that car was inspired by this car. In fact, I think this is the first aero engined car ever built. But you want me to stop talking now. You want to know what it sounds like and what it drives like out on the street. So I'm going to shut up. Let's do that. Okay, in order to get the beast flight worthy, and, it, and I say flight worthy because there's lots of rocker switches and actually none of them are labelled. There's a strict procedure to, to firing up um, the beast. I've got Steve just off camera, who's the custodian of the beast, who's leaving a Hawkeye on me. So I turn the ignition on one click and there's a light down there which tells me it's okay. Then I go to this bank of switches and it's the fourth one in which is the check for the electric fan, because you have to do checks. Then I, that one and that one, that one. Those two there are the electric fuel pumps. I will check them. So I just run one of them and I can see there's pressure. Second one, definitely pressure. There's a tiny gauge down by my left foot, it's buried. So they're okay. And then you prime it with that one. Yes, you prime it with that one for five seconds. Sorry, not that one. No, it's not that one. Yeah, it's that one. It. That one, yeah. That one's a prime. So it's, I'm glad I don't, I don't, I'm glad I'm. Hey guys. No, it's right. So that's the priming one. You prime that for five seconds. And then you leave it on and then hit the. And then leave it on. Yeah. And then I switch the, uh, the other fuel pump on. And the other fuel pump on. And then I flick the magnetos. And then I fire the button.
I don't want to stall it, so I'm actually left foot braking it just to, when it's cold, we just want to make sure it's happy. Right, let's go. I've been fortunate enough in my career to drive a lot of interesting cars. A lot. I'm not sure I've ever driven anything like the Beast. No, no seatbelt. Just ear splitting, the transmission clouds are coming from here. And that's Wow. No power steering. John and John never, never got round to it. But actually it feels similar to my Dodge Charger with no power assistance. This lovely wood rear 70 steering wheel. You are aware of the bonnet. No seat belts. But good visibility, thankfully. Roundabout number one in the beat. Just 
warming up. She's warming up now. Let's see what it is. It feels so weird without the seatbelt. What a sensory overload. The beast. Wow, that was that was quite something. That really was quite something. Quite daunting. And I did feel I I I, I almost felt the sort of spirit of of John Dodd watching over me. Because John used to drive this car hard. If you look at any old archive footage, he would give it some and he would notoriously talk about taking it on the autobahns in Germany and trying to kind of V-max it. But of course, back then the tires weren't that great. There weren't many 200 mile an hour tires. It's so loud, but you can't actually tell it's a V12 until you kind of start carrying a bit of speed. It's, it's all the, the cacophony of the gearbox and the whole transmission system. But actually the ride is really good. No seat belts, these amazing kind of Buck Rogers chairs, you just lay back in them. And, it, and the steering's nowhere near as heavy as I was expecting. Um, I'm used to my Dodge Charge, which has no um, power steering. It's quite similar. Once you're above kind of 20 miles an hour, it all just feels all right. Oh, wow, what an experience though. It feels properly special. I'm tingling. And it's, it's you, you can imagine if I could give you the smell through the, through the screen, you'd know how this car would smell. I, I feel like someone's just tipped a can of petrol over my face. But it's, it's, it's phenomenal. What a phenomenal thing. Goodness me. I never thought I'd actually see the beast in the metal, uh, let alone drive it, and it feels ex extremely special, actually quite emotional. But you know, I felt overwhelming sense of responsibility. This is a true one-off car. If you're watching this at a time when we've just released this video, the car auction will still be live. You, you could own this. You could be the first person outside of the Dodd family to ever own it. It's a true heirloom and a true eccentric extension of John Dodd's personality. It's a completely pointless car, but also it's an incredible feat of engineering and it's notorious and infamous in a purest sense. So many magazine covers, so many BBC interviews, so many press cuttings. It's just, it's a very, very special slice of our petrol head kingdom. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Late Break Show as much as I have. If you haven't already subscribed, then what are you thinking? You need to subscribe. If you want to become a Patreon, have a look in the description below and you can support us that way. Or maybe you want to have a look at our merch shop. Again, I'll put a link in the, link in the description. In fact, I will put a link in the description for the, for the auction of this. Yeah, I'll do that. Thanks for watching.